Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Brad or Steam, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the controversial murder of Greg Williams. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. Now, before we get into the details of today's case, I first need to say a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, and that is Aura. So I want to start this video off with a question for you, and that is this. Have you ever Googled your name or the name of somebody you loved and found that a bunch of your private information was on one of those public listing sites? Because it is far more common than you may think for your private information, the stuff that's just for you, to get out there on the internet for anyone to see. And that is because there are these things, these entities out there called data brokers and data brokers take your personal information and they sell it to people that you do not want to have it like spammers and robo callers and they're making a lot of money off of your information they can even okay they can even find out where you live <sighs> i'm not down with that sickness and that is why i want to introduce you to aura now, did you know that data brokers are legally required to remove your information if you ask them to? Yeah, sounds great, right? Except they make it super difficult for you to figure out which data brokers have your information so that you can actually reach out to them and have your information removed. And that's where Aura comes in. Aura identifies which of the pesky data brokers have your information and then they submit opt-out requests on your behalf. They do the work so that you do not have to. When I first signed up for Aura, one of the very, actually the very first thing I did is went to the data broker opt-out section because I was like, let's just see how many of these data brokers actually had my information. And it turned out like 30, like 30 of them. And Aura had already gone and submitted opt-out requests on my behalf, but that's not the only thing that they do for you. They also see if your information has been leaked on the dark web. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, but nobody wants their information leaked on the dark web because then it just gets sold from person to person. And that's when you get identity theft and things like that. We've dealt with it in this household and it is such a hard thing to get out of. And in addition to that, they see if your passwords are strong, which like, you know, for like your banking, all the things that you do online. And it turns out that my passwords are super strong, which made me very happy because I've had the same passwords since 2007. <laughs> I remember the year specifically because there was like a life defining event that made me choose this particular password. It turns out it's a very strong password. It is tough as all get out, but I wouldn't have known that if it wasn't for Aura. And those are just a couple of the many things that Aura does to protect you and your family from online threats that you just simply cannot see. Through just the Aura app, which is super easy to set up, you can get things like parental controls, which I'm getting closer and closer to needing. I don't even want to talk about it. And, you know, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. And you get it all in one place. You don't need several apps because there are separate apps for things like this, but you get it all in one place and at one affordable price. Now it sounds like a great deal to me. And of course, I'm not your mom. I can't tell you what to do. But what I can say is that I value your privacy and I don't want people to exploit you and to profit off of your private information. And you don't have to. You can let Aura help keep you safe online. You can let Aura do all the hard work for you. And of course, I have great news. Aura is offering members of the Brat Pack the opportunity to peruse all they have to offer for free for two weeks through the link in my description box. So if all of that sounds as good to you as it does to me, make sure to go to aura.com slash Bratterstein. The link is in my description box. And there should also be a QR code that's been on the screen that you can click as well. And with that, you will get a free 14 day trial to see if anyone has leaked your personal information. And if they have, let Aura help you put a stop to it today. Now, I just want to say a big thank you to Aura for partnering with me on today's video. It's partners like Aura that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do for you. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock. Don't ever change. All right, let's go ahead and get into this video. This video is on a case that, like many other videos on this channel and many other cases, I stumbled upon while researching another case. And when I started to read the bullet points about this case, I was like, oh, I have heard of this before. I saw another YouTuber, somebody that I really like, cover this case a while back. So I kind of knew what I was getting into. But of course, 
I wanted to do my own research because that's the kind of bee that I am. So I did. And once I looked further into this case, I was like, wow, there is so much more to this case than I had previously known. So I was like, I want to do a deep dive. And I really quickly went and I looked on YouTube and I found that a lot of people hadn't done like really deep dives on this case. I did see just today, like the day I'm filming this, that 48 Hours did put out an episode on this case. I haven't watched it yet. I'm curious. I saw the runtime and I feel like mine's going to be longer. So I'm curious what they decided, like what they felt compelled to keep versus cut compared to what I chose to keep versus cut because obviously a person's life is very complex and you can't put every single thing into one video. But all that is to say, I didn't see a lot of like deep dives into the case. So I was like, I want to be the one and I dove deep. Let me tell you, this case is insane. And today I'm going to tell you that entire story. I read all the things so that you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I want you to answer the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it kicking around in your brain as we go through all of the complicated details of this case. But of course I want you to answer once you have something to go on. And the question of the day, there's a couple are these one, what do you think happened? Like, what do you think? I guess all these questions kind of make one, question that's going to be said in like a complicated way. But what do you think happened to Greg Williams? Do you think he was murdered? Do you think it's possible he took his own life? You'll know why I'm asking these questions. You know what? Actually one more. Do you think the person that is believed to have taken the life of Greg Williams also may have committed another murder? You'll know why I'm asking these questions after we go through all the details of this case. So make sure to answer at the end of this video, because I would love to know what you think. Now, with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the murder of Greg Williams. Our story today begins on October 13th, 2011, and this is in Keller, Texas. It was at about 4.40 a.m. when Keller police received a call that led them to this nice four-story home located at 1410 Jacob Avenue. And this was like a really big house that was tucked away in this nice little gated community. And this area that they were going to, Keller, was said to be like a great place, a super safe place, the type of place that you would want to go and raise your kids. It had an overall niche grade, which is like a website that like grades neighborhoods, I guess. I don't know if my neighborhood's on there. I didn't look, but I looked at this neighborhood and it was rated overall as an A. But now police were headed to this home because the matriarch of the family, this was a woman named Michelle, had called police and told them that an intruder had come into her house, had murdered her husband, and that she was worried the guy, the person, could still be inside. So police get to the home and they find Michelle sitting on the porch just crying and she has a huge welt to the side of her face. So some officers stay outside and deal with her and others go into the house to search. And inside the house, they find, you know, a horrible scene. They find the patriarch of the house. His name was Greg. He was in the couple's bed and there was blood, you know, everywhere. And he had been killed by a single gunshot wound. And inside the home on the couch in the living room, they also found the couple's four-year-old daughter still asleep. Now in the bedroom where Greg was found, there was a door and this door went from the bedroom out into the yard and it was left slightly open. So when officers looked out to see like why it was slightly open, they found that on the ground right outside the door, there was a gun, which was determined to be the gun used to kill Greg. There was also a shell casing and next to that, there was a wrench and this wrench was used to hit Michelle in the face. And that's why when they pulled up, she had a welt on her cheek. So police talked to Michelle, of course, because they're trying to figure out how something like this could happen. Because again, this is a super well-off neighborhood. This is an area where things like this just don't happen. And she doesn't seem to have any idea how this could happen either. She tells police that everything about that night had been totally normal until it wasn't. She said that she and Greg had been sitting up together talking during the evening because they were super excited because just like a day after Greg was killed, the two of them were set to close on like their dream home. So they were up all excited talking like about their future. They were talking about what life would look like in their new home, what the house would look like, what sort of renovations they wanted to do. They talked so long that eventually Michelle just fell asleep and everything just seemed great. And overall, like to almost anyone you would ask, there was no reason why anyone would want to target Greg or Michelle Williams. But then Michelle tells police that she wakes up to the sound of a loud noise. So she runs to go and check on her husband. And she says that that's when a man who was wearing all black with a thick country accent hit her in the face with the wrench before turning to her husband and shooting him in the temple before presumably like fleeing the scene. But 
as Michelle was questioned and evidence was collected, things were not really adding up. And as you know, the, the fact that things weren't adding up was presented to Michelle, her story changed. Her story morphed into something so complicated, sensational, and just ridiculous that it had everyone asking, well, not everyone, but many people asking what really happened that night to Greg Williams. So let's now go back a little bit. Let's start with Michelle. So Michelle was born in Hearst, Texas. She went to LD Bell High School, but she ended up dropping out before graduation because she found out that she was pregnant. And after learning she was pregnant, she and her high school romance, Kenneth, got married because, you know, you get pregnant young, you get married. That's something that sometimes people do. And that's what they did here. So Kenneth joined the military and he and his new wife tried to make the relationship work, even though, you know, they were separate a lot. They were moving around a lot and they had this new little baby, but it seems like this relationship was doomed from the start for a couple of reasons. One being that they just got together so young. You know what I mean? I think she was 17 and he was like 16, which not all young relationships are doomed, but it's definitely, it definitely can be challenging because as you grow, sometimes you don't grow together, ETC, ETC, but that wasn't the big one. The big one is that Michelle had actually lied to Kenneth to get him to marry her in the first place. That's a big problem because here's the thing. She was pregnant, right? And she told Kenneth, this is your baby. So they got married, but it turns out this wasn't Kenneth's baby. The father of this baby was some guy named John, but she didn't tell Kenneth this. Apparently she didn't tell Kenneth this for years. Even after they separated, Kenneth paid child support for a child that wasn't his. She did not tell him the baby wasn't his until the child had turned 18. So the child support payments had stopped anyway. So Michelle, kind of a piece of shit from the beginning. That's a shitty thing to do. But it seems like she, not to give her any like grace here, just an explanation, not, not an excuse, an explanation, is that Michelle might have learned how to be like a shady human being from a young age because word on the street is that her dad kind of sucked too. So he worked construction jobs and he was said to be sort of a con man and he would like purposely get hurt on these jobs so that he could try to sue the companies. And apparently he wasn't like a good con man because he wasn't successful at winning these lawsuits. But the area they lived in was small enough that like word got around the town that he was this type of guy. So it seems that perhaps Michelle learned how to be shitty from her father. But moving on. So that's bad, but obviously Kenneth didn't know the baby wasn't his. So that's not what ended the relationship. I'm just saying that's part of what doomed it from the start. Cause you can't have like a nice loving relationship with somebody who literally lies to your face about something so serious. But what really ended the relationship is that it looks like Michelle cheated a little bit. Now she claims that she never cheated, that in every relationship she had been in, the men were cheating on her. But many people, including her own children were like, that's bullshit. She cheated constantly. But we do know for sure is that Michelle reconnected with some guy that she had known growing up. Apparently they grew up in the same hometown. He knew Michelle, he knew Michelle's sister. And this was a guy named Brandon. So Michelle and Brandon, they hit it off, which effectively, you know, ends her relationship with Kenneth. And when I say ends, I mean, they separated, they didn't get divorced, but we'll get to that shortly. So she gets in this relationship with Brandon and she's super young. Like she's super young already. Everything that's happened so far, she's been very young. By the time her and Brandon are together, she's in her early twenties and she already has three kids. She has two boys and a girl, but Brandon apparently was all in. He was head over heels in love with Michelle and he loved the kids, which real side note, but we'll get right back on track. I have a question for you. You guys have been very helpful in helping me understand phrases in the past. So can you explain head over heels to me? Because one could say that anytime I am standing, my head is above my heels. So what does that mean? But anyways, Brandon loved her. He thought he was lucky to have her. He thought the relationship was great. He thought that she was great, but of course it didn't last very long because the mask that Michelle wore started to drop or just like the lies that she told were starting to unravel. Cause you can only lie so long before somebody's going to be like, I think you're full of shit. And that happened with Brandon and Michelle. He started to be able to tell that she wasn't a great person and that she was a huge liar because that was her thing. 
she was a liar. She was the type of person who would lie to get anything she wanted. If she thought that telling a lie would get her to where she wanted to be or something that she wanted or a person that she wanted, she would do that. So here's what happened. Here's an example of this. It's crazy. So she wanted Brandon, right? So she tells Brandon that she is divorced because she wants him. Why is my voice cracking? She wanted Brandon to commit to her. So she told Brandon she was divorced from Kenneth, but she was still legally married. So Brandon proposes to Michelle. They're planning a wedding. They're about to get married. And she's like, so here's the thing. We actually can't get married because I am still like technically married. I hope that's not like a huge problem for you. Now, of course, Brandon was upset about this at first, but she told him, she's like, listen, I know I lied to you, but it was for good reasons. And it's because Kenneth, man, he's like hella abusive. Okay. He's very abusive to me. He still continues to be abusive to me. And I didn't know how he would react if I was to give him papers. And even though Brandon was upset about this, he believed her and he loved her at first, but he has come out and said, cause he has given interviews. He has come out and said that like, none of that was true, that she's just hella manipulative, that Kenneth never abused her and that she was just cheating on Kenneth and he didn't know it. He said that she is such a manipulative person and so good at it that she could convince a man that a fence post was talking to her. Now, eventually Michelle did divorce Kenneth and in 1994, her and Brandon were married and things seemed to be going well for the two. Like Brandon had a job in IT. Did he own his company? I think he did. He owned an IT company. And as for Michelle, she kind of moved around a bit. It was a little, you know, wishy-washy with her. She was working as a dental assistant, but she seemed to move positions to different places often. And it turns out that she was just like quitting or being fired. Like that's why she was switching jobs. But Brent didn't know that. He did end up finding out though. And this is another instance of Michelle lying. So it looks like Michelle got fired from this dental assistant job for stealing, right? But she would still like pretend to go to work at the dental assistant job because she didn't tell Brandon this happened. So she ends up taking a new job. It's a lower paying job at a topless bar, but she doesn't tell Brandon this. He thinks she's working as a dental assistant, but then he eventually finds out that she's no longer working as the dental assistant. And she, you know, back into a corner, starts to lie and starts to try to spin this yarn spin this yarn. Is that a thing? She starts lying and she tells him like, yes, I did leave the dental assistant job, but I'm now working as a telemarketer. Like everything's great. But as I said, that wasn't true. That wasn't where she worked. She was working at a topless bar and Brandon didn't really believe her. He was like, I don't know. This sounds like bullshit. You ma'am have a tendency to lie to me. So he was like, I'm gonna find out. And he did find out because Michelle gave him a phone number for her work in case they would ever need it. Cause they're married. You know what I mean? You have your spouse's phone number for work. And one day he called it and oh my God, Shyamalan twist. This was not a telemarketer place. This was a topless bar. So he's upset about this and he drives over to confront her. So he gets there they fight. The reason he's so upset besides the lying is that there were allegations that she may have been involved in sex work uh, as well. And this wasn't something that like they talked about and like not something he wasn't comfortable with if that was happening, but either way it got messy and she agreed to leave with him. She quit the job. She took her stuff and she left with them and they were planning to work on their relationship, but things didn't go well because shortly thereafter he started to get the suspicion that she may be being, may be being unfaithful. Brandon already felt like the vibes were off, but he ended up finding out that this was true, that his suspicions were correct when he started talking to neighbors and he found out that there were cars often a coming and a going from this home, a coming more often than not. Hoo-ah. Anyways, he is suspicious. And so he puts a recording device in the home to find out if what he believes is happening is true. And it turns out it was. He said in the span of one day, he caught on the recording device that she had two different men come over to their house for their little tete tets It sounds like she was literally the type of woman who needed to keep athletic shoes in her bag to sprint from one sexual encounter to the next, which if you're single, get it lady. But Michelle, ma'am, you were not. And now, man, she couldn't even deny it was happening because he literally had it on tape. Can you imagine hearing those tapes as him? I, I picture it exactly. And I don't know if everyone's going to get this reference. I'm sure a lot of you will, but I picture it exactly like on liar, liar when they're in the courtroom and she's on the tape recorder and she's like, Oh, you're such a better lover than my husband. And freaking Jim Carrey's like, your honor, I object. 
Why is that, Mr. Reed? Because it's devastating to my case. Overruled. Good call. Like that, all of that, right up there. Anyways, he now knows about the affair and obviously he's pissed and he tells her he wants a divorce and she takes this poorly, one could say. Okay, she literally killed all his fish. He had this aquarium with like super expensive fish and she killed his fish and then she poisoned his dog this bitch. He had a Dalmatian and she literally poisoned it and then took it to the vet so that they could, you know, check out the dog and had them put the dog to sleep. When I tell you, <laughs> oh my God, it's not funny at all. I'm like angry. I'm so mad. When I tell you, dude, I would lose my in mind if somebody did that. Like that dog was his, you know, his buddy, his life, and she killed it. <sighs> And Brandon gave an interview about this where he said, quote, if you're shocked at this point, we've only scratched the surface. And when I tell you that is such a perfect quote for how this case is going to go, because when I tell you, we have still not even scratched the surface with this woman. Anyways, after Brandon, Michelle moves on again to another man, and this is John. And if you're wondering if it's a coincidence that this man's name is John and her first baby that she told Kenneth was his baby was actually fathered by a man named John, the answer is no, it's not a coincidence. This is the same. John, they reconnected. They ended up getting together. I don't know if they ever got married, but they were together a really long time. And after almost 10 years, their relationship fell apart because again, John thought Michelle was cheating. I guess he had found like some receipts for some sketchy stuff in her purse or something like that. And a to-do list to buy a birthday card for the man who would go on to be her next husband. And this was Greg Williams. But of course, before getting with Greg, the relationship had to end with John and ending a relationship with Michelle was not easy. So John suspects Michelle stepping out. He decides, cool, I'm done. He leaves the premises that they shared together. And he's like, I'm going to come back and get my shit. He leaves some stuff. He leaves. He comes back to get his stuff. And he finds that this woman is having a yard sale in the front yard with all of his stuff. Can you imagine just rolling up on this? Can you imagine the fight that they had when she's just selling his shit? I don't even know. But Michelle was said to be the type of person who like was one petty and two very money driven. She did not want to live paycheck to paycheck. She wanted a better life. She wanted to be financially stable. So if she could, you know, kill two birds with one stone by selling some of her ex's stuff to get money, which is something she wanted, and also piss off somebody who had the audacity to leave her in the first place, that was a win-win for her. Now, with that relationship over with John, she moved on to her next soon-to-be husband, and this was Greg Williams. Because that was the thing with Michelle. She would get in these relationships, things would get super messy and toxic, and then she would just kind of push it to the side and move on with her life and leave everything behind her. And by the time she met Greg, her kids were older, so she just kind of pushed them to the side too for Greg because she knew that he could provide her with like a financially stable life. Her sons literally said that Michelle was never really there for them. They say that they were constantly moving around to different homes, motels, and trailers as Michelle like jumped from dude to dude. And they say that her kids were never really a priority for her. And that remained true when Michelle, you know, met and started a relationship with Greg, a man who truthfully her, her sons didn't really care for. So Michelle and Greg, they met in 2007 and Greg was exactly what Michelle had been looking for. Greg was a successful businessman, a computer engineer who had a successful career that he ran out of his home, bringing in half a million dollars a year, dude. And he was said to be brilliant, the type of guy who could sell anything to anyone. He was also a big fitness guy who loved working out and loved martial arts. He was even a fourth degree black belt and like, ripped. And he was also a family man, the type of guy who put everyone he loved first. Family was incredibly important to him because he didn't have like an easy childhood. His father was said to have been abusive. So he wanted to be completely the opposite of that. Craig, like Michelle, had been in a few relationships. Like Michelle, he had been married. And like Michelle, he was a parent. He had one daughter. This was a preteen girl, preteen, 12's preteen, right? Yeah named Taylor, who he had had with his ex-wife, Kathy, before, you know, meeting and falling for Michelle. So Michelle and Greg actually met online in like a BDSM sort of like 
chat room are chat rooms still a thing i'm sure they are i don't chat room i used to chat room aol chat rooms and then they'd be like asl if you are younger than me you're gonna be like what and if you're older than me you're gonna be like you were probably too young to be in there and you are correct but they meet in this chat room online whatever and they decide they're gonna meet in person and they meet in like an interesting way it turns out that michelle greg and greg's brother all met at a nightclub and while at this nightclub michelle did some stuff to greg like publicly with his brother there which is like not something i would personally do but it seemed that michelle was the type of person who used her sexuality because she was an attractive woman obviously i don't like to say that murderers are attractive even if they objectively are you'll probably notice in my videos i don't usually say that but it's worth mentioning in this situation that like michelle was an attractive woman and she used that to her advantage to get the things that she wanted and though this isn't you know how i would move forward with a relationship it seemed to work for both of them because a relationship did ensue and man he was said to be so into her he was said to like be very doting of her to treat her like gold he got like a maid and a nanny and she even like wanted a boob job so he paid for her to have one even michelle herself said of his love for her and i quote greg treated me like a queen he took me from day one and put me on an untouchable pedestal Nobody's ever treated me that way. He was my knight in shining armor. Now, as I said, Greg, very into Michelle, and she was seemingly very into him, but people in their lives were not so sure about like the relationship in general and how fast it was moving because within months of meeting each other, they were already getting married. And as far as Michelle's family went, her sons didn't like Greg. They thought he was an arrogant bully. And as far as what Greg's family thought of Michelle, they didn't like her right from the beginning and referred to her as a quote, hypersexual gold digger. It just seemed that everyone felt this was more of like a superficial relationship for both of them. Like Michelle just wanted somebody with money, somebody who could keep her financially stable where she didn't have to work and she could give, you know, live the life that she believed she deserved. And as far as Greg, he wanted like a hot trophy wife, somebody who could keep up with him, you know, cause they both had a little bit of like more of a party lifestyle and somebody who was, you know, a bit of a freak in the sheets. And Michelle had no problem being that for somebody with money. Now, a lot of people in Greg's life didn't like Michelle, but one that was very vocal was his ex-wife, Kathy. And there's a good chance he didn't take her concerns with Michelle very seriously because she was the ex-wife. So he could just be like, well, bitch, you're jealous or whatever. I don't know. That's how he was, but that could be how one could think of her not liking his new partner. But she was absolutely right because Michelle was the type of person who needed to be the center of attention. She felt, she seemed to be the type of person who felt like she was God's gift to anyone whose life she decided to walk into. So if you are not worshiping her and only her, what the fuck's wrong with you kind of thing. So even though Greg gave her so much love and attention and everything, Michelle seemed to be a little bit jealous because Greg had a daughter. He had this 12 year old daughter named Taylor and his kid was his number one. Now, at first, Michelle and Greg's daughter, Taylor, seemed to get along. They would go to movies together. They would go shopping together. Taylor even went with Michelle and Greg on a cruise to Mexico. But as time went on, it seemed like Michelle was jealous, not only of the relationship that he had with Taylor, but by extension, his ex, Kathy. So it really seemed to get much worse when during the summer, Taylor would start staying at her father's house on the weekdays and her mom's on the weekends. And with Taylor being in the home so much more often during this time, her and Michelle started to butt heads a little bit. This woman ended up being so jealous of a 12 year old girl. Like I'm going to tell you a story right now and you're gonna be like, you gotta be exaggerating. That can't possibly be true, but I am not making this up. Okay. Michelle tells Greg that his 12 year old daughter who has never been a problem child, by the way, is on drugs. She then goes on to tell him, that Taylor had drugged her coffee. Okay. Michelle ended up in the hospital for two days due to an overdose of narcotics and painkillers. And as a result, Greg ended up having his daughter Taylor sent to a drug rehab facility because Michelle told Greg that Taylor was addicted to painkillers. This is a 12 year old girl. Now needless to say, Kathy, Greg's ex, Taylor's 
mom was livid about this. It was after this that she stopped letting Taylor go and spend the night with her father. And she said that if she had enough money, many people would have been sued in the situation. But Michelle, she was stoked because that meant that Taylor, she's out of the picture. And now it could just be her, Greg, and their little baby daughter. Because I didn't mention this yet, but it wasn't that, you know, Michelle didn't want kids with Greg. She just didn't want his kid from a previous relationship around because the two did go on to have a daughter, a baby daughter named Michaela, who, by the way, Michelle claimed that along with drugging her and her coffee, she had also tried to drug the baby as well. Anyways, from the outside, anyone looking in at this couple would have thought that things were going super well. They had this happy marriage, this new baby girl. They were doing well financially with Greg having his own IT business. The two also owned a frozen yogurt spot and a gym. Well, actually the yogurt shop was technically Michelle's because Greg bought her a yogurt shop as a gift. Like, ma'am, the two had matching Mercedes that they had gotten, that they had leased. They were leasing Mercedes that they had gotten for an anniversary together. And they lived in this giant house. It was referred to in one documentary as a McMansion. And again, it was in Keller, Texas in this nice gated community, a nice safe area. They often hosted parties for birthdays or just pool parties or like entertaining clients. The house was always filled with people and family and they had barbecues and it was just like a great time over there. So they were seemingly doing well and didn't want for much, you know? At least it didn't seem like they would want for much, you know? But it turns out what was really going on is that they were living far above their means. They were not doing as well financially as many people thought they were. They were not doing as well financially as even Greg thought they were because he worked at this IT business, right? But Michelle was the one who did the books. Michelle, a woman who had a real spending problem and was always spending more money than they had. She was the one in charge of the books. So Greg had no idea. This woman was just demolishing their disposable income. She would buy everything like designer bags, designer clothes, anything she wanted, she would buy. And then she would just fix the books to make it look like they still had all this money. On top of that, something that Greg didn't know is that Michelle had like in many other relationships, gotten eyes for another man. This man's name was Jean and Jean was actually one of the close friends of one of her adult sons. So Jean was like the same age as this adult son. Her son was not happy about this, but here's the thing. Even though he was a lot younger, he was her son's friend. Um, he was also like a young, hot fitness instructor and Michelle saw and Michelle wanted. Though Michelle would say that the relationship between her and Jean did not start until after Greg was gone. But I will say that things sure did seem to move pretty fast immediately upon Greg being killed. So, so was this happening? We can't say for sure. I think it was, but if it was, they were really keeping it on the DL because no one seemed to know what was going on. Greg and Michelle seemed very happy. They weren't like obviously in a bad relationship. Neither of them was telling their friends that they had problems, nothing like that. They were just seemingly happy. They were even in the process of buying a new home, even bigger and better than the one they were in. It was going to have this nice pool and this built in aquarium. It was great. So everything was going so well until it wasn't. The night that Greg was killed was a totally normal night. He, Michelle, and their daughter, Michaela, went to his other daughter, Taylor's choir concert. He was there, he videotaped the whole thing. He gave his daughter a hug and a kiss, and then they left. On the way home, they stopped and got Mexican food for dinner, to which I say, Homer growl or gargle on spit, whichever. And then they went home. The rest of this version of the story comes from Michelle, but she says that the two of them sat in their bed with their daughter watching Netflix, talking about the future until Michelle and her daughter fell asleep in the bed, but not before she, Michelle, saw Greg take three Tylenol PM. So her and her daughter were sleeping in the bed with him when she woke up at about 3 a.m. and she ended up moving her and her daughter to sleep on the couch instead of in the bed. Why? I don't know, that's not explained, but she says that when she woke up at this time, Greg was still awake, that he didn't really say much. He just said that he didn't feel well. 
So then she and her daughter moved and they were sleeping on the couch when she was awoken in the night to a loud noise. She says when she heard this noise, she ran into the bedroom where Greg was sleeping. And then as she ran in the room, a man that was dressed in all black took a metal wrench and smacked her in the face. She said as she lay there on the ground, she saw this man then take a gun that turned out to be Greg's gun that had been in his nightstand to take it and to shoot Greg in the temple before fleeing through the door in the couple's room that led to the yard. She said of this moment, and I quote, I was knocked out. When I came to, I could see movement. I heard something that I did not realize was a gunshot at that moment, and he ran out the back door. But from the very beginning, there were so many things about the scene that just seemed a little off to investigators. Like, okay, even from the moment that they arrived to find Michelle sitting on the porch crying, they noted that she was supposed to have been asleep, right? This is like just after five in the morning or whatever, because, you know, the attack, the call came, well, it could be like just before five in the morning. I don't know what the response time was. The call was 4.40 a.m bitch should have been sleeping. But when they got there, they noted that she was like really put together for somebody who was supposedly sleeping. Her hair was done. She was like fully dressed. And they even noted that she was wearing a bra and the officers were like, most women don't wear a bra. For those women who do wear a bra, I imagine that the first thing you do when you come into the house is just pop that bitch off. Right. But she was wearing one. And on top of that, I said that she was sitting on the porch crying when they pulled up, which was sort of true. She was on the porch looking like she was crying, but she was mostly just screaming. There weren't any actual tears. Anyways, within no time, the place was buzzing with cops and not just the home, the whole gated community. It was filled with cop cars and sirens and police and detectives and forensic tests, tests, techs doing tests. The whole place was pandemonium and the home was taped off. So inside the home, they find Greg sleeping in the couple's bedroom. And something about the scene that was super strange to them is that inside the room, the TV was on and it was blaring. Apparently it was so loud that the cops didn't even try to like talk to each other over the sound of the TV because it would have been fruitless. It was that loud. And then even though the TV was that loud and there had been a gunshot in the house and all these cops have been walking through the house, the four-year-old daughter is still asleep on the couch which just seems super weird to me, especially because she called the cops saying that the intruder might still be in the house. And then she sat outside alone and left her daughter in there sleeping while she cried on the porch that, uh, you know, I don't know about me. I don't know about you. I don't know about anything. I'm just a girl on the internet, but I feel like I would just like the first thing I would do would be to grab my baby. Like the very, like I come to consciousness, I grab my baby, but that's, you know, just me. And then another thing that I thought was weird is that the gun, the shell casing and the wrench were just like, placed right next to each other, right outside the door, leaving the room. So all of that seemed weird, but there was more. That's not all that seemed weird. There was also no sign of forced entry. Like there was some scratches. There were some scratches on the door. Like somebody had scratched it and tried to jimmy it, but there was no actual damage to the lock. So it wouldn't have been like they broke in through that. It was just superficial scratching. Another thing they thought was weird is that the bullet casing was found outside by the back door instead of in the bed with Greg, because if he had been shot there, or if he had shot himself, which we're going to get into soon, don't worry, the bullet casing would have fallen into the bed, not somehow ended up outside the door. And if that's not weird enough, they also found an empty bottle of like Clorox wipes. There were no Clorox wipes anywhere in the house and they weren't in the trash, but the thing was empty. And that in combination with the fact that there were no fingerprints anywhere. Everything had been wiped clean. There was nothing on the door. There was nothing on the gun. There was nothing on the wrench, nothing. It looked like somebody had cleaned up and doctored this crime scene. So with that, Michelle was brought in for questioning, which would have happened anyway, but they just felt like they needed to hear her side of the story again to try to make the math math. You know what I mean? So she was there for five hours and as they questioned her, it still just wasn't making sense. So all of the things that I already mentioned were super strange and they noted those things. But on top of that, the house was like untouched. Nothing had been rifled through. It didn't look like anyone was trying to steal something or steal anything rather. And there was even money. There was like a safe full of cash right there untouched. And additionally, the person would have had to have come into this house unarmed because Greg was killed with his own gun. So this person comes in the house unarmed. So obviously their intent wasn't to kill, but obviously their intent also wasn't to rob because nothing was taken. So they come into the house and they take Greg's gun specifically to kill him. That makes 
no sense. And there was the fact that they checked like surveillance videos because remember this is a gated community. There's security up the butt, not, well, not security, but you know what I mean? It's a secured place. People have cameras. It's that kind of neighborhood. And they look and there are like no strange cars. I think there was one car that came in and it was for like, what was it? A male person, a delivery person, something that was unrelated. They checked it, they cleared it. So nobody came into this gated community. Nobody's seen leaving this gated community, but yet somebody came in this gated community and killed Greg. So with that, their questioning of Michelle got more forceful and deliberate. They ask her, like, with all of these things I'm telling you don't add up, how are you going to continue to say that somebody broke into your house and killed your husband? But she sticks to her story. So the cop kind of changes tactics here. And I think his initial plan was to give her enough rope to hang herself, which it was sort of effective, but not immediately effective, which we're going to get into. But he goes, okay, maybe this happened. He proposes a theory to her. Is it possible that maybe Greg took took Greg took his own life okay and you just cleaned up the scene so that you could get his life insurance money and then he went on to tell her about a case he had worked where that exact thing had happened but she still denied it the cop tells her like listen either you did it or he did it and you cleaned it up those are the only two options and when pushed against a wall after hours of interrogation of being interrogated Michelle says exactly what he expects her to say she says that he killed himself and she just simply cleaned up after a suicide. And she said specifically of this quote, he was so stupid, such a stupid person for killing himself. She said after Greg took his own life, she wanted to make the whole thing look like a burglary so that her daughter wouldn't have to grow up knowing her father had taken his own life. She said that she took the gun from Greg and she wiped it down with Clorox wipes. She said she wiped everything down with Clorox wipes. And then after the gun was cleaned, she set it outside the door. She said that she then called 911. And while she was waiting for police to arrive, that's when she took like, um, I believe a screwdriver and messed up the door frame to make it look like forced entry. And then she grabbed that wrench and hit herself in the face in an attempt to make it look like, you know, more legitimate, but she accidentally hit herself too hard and actually did knock herself out. After hearing all of this, Michelle was arrested, but she was arrested for filing a false police report. They, I think they just wanted to be able to hold her for a time while they looked into her for more serious charges, because though it sounds fishy, they didn't have anything against her that actually pointed to her murdering Greg, but they definitely believed she did. So they needed to get enough evidence to prove it. And police were not alone because the people in Greg's life who knew and loved him did not believe this story that he took his own life at all. Like Michelle told them that he did. And she even told them to like solidify her story. She told them that shortly before he had actually been successful at taking his own life, she had gone into the garage and found that both cars were turned on. And she was kind of implying that he had been out there trying to take his own life with like carbon monoxide poisoning or whatever, like in midsummer which is a movie in case you haven't seen it, but they didn't believe at it all. They didn't think that he was in the sort of mindset that one would need to be in to take their own life because he had never shown any signs of any sort of depression, which you don't have to, but they were like, I know him, he wouldn't have done this. And on top of that, they knew that Greg kind of had the mindset that taking one's life was the cowardly thing to do. He used like more aggressive wording than that. And that's because he had recently been traumatized when his close friend and brother-in-law, his name was Bryn, had taken his own life a year earlier. Apparently Greg had been very vocal about thinking that taking one's life was a shitty thing to do because when Bryn had done this, he had effectively, you know, ruined his family's lives and they just couldn't see Greg having that mindset and then going on to do the same thing. And if that wasn't enough for his family, it was the fact that he didn't seem unhappy at all to them. His mother, Betty said like the last time they talked, he was happy. He was hopeful. He was excited about the future. He was excited to build this dream house and to move on with this next chapter of his life, which didn't align with him ending it himself. On top of that, Michelle was acting super weird after her husband's death. Like her own sister pointed out that she was acting weird. She said that Michelle came to her house after Greg died, the day after Greg died and that she didn't seem really affected at all. She didn't want to talk about Greg and occasionally she would like pretend to cry, but again, there weren't any tears. And she said on top of that, that that night, Michelle spent the night at her house and she woke up in the morning, super excited to like go get some pancakes. Like let's go have pancake breakfast, which just didn't feel right to her. Also almost immediately, Michelle contacted Greg's lawyer and had a check written from his business account 
and she started like immediately selling off his assets. Like, okay, the yogurt shop that he bought her, he had bought it just recently for $100,000 and she sold it on Craigslist for like $50,000. And then, you know, Greg's IT business, the IT business that brought in a million, no, half a million buco buckos. Okay. A year she sold it for $8,000. $8,000. And on top of that, she just immediately dipped. She scooped up her daughter and she left and went on like a mini vacation where she was seen hanging out at bars and buying like um, Halloween costumes and not just Halloween costumes for kids, like adult Halloween costumes for herself. But before going on this vacation, she did something else that was weird. So she called her adult sons to let them know that Greg had taken his own life. And of course they went over there to console their mother and to help her clean up the home. Cause remember after a violent crime, you clean up your own home or you hire somebody to do so, which is crazy, but that's how it is. So they come over and she ends up taking her son, Andrew to the side to talk to him privately. And that's where she tells him that Greg didn't take his own life, that he actually was murdered by an intruder and that she had only told the suicide story because the police had like pressured her to do so. Now at first he believed her, that was his mom and he loved her, but his opinion started to sort of change a little bit and he started to feel a little off about the whole situation when Michelle started to tell him that she had an idea who did it. She thought that Greg's ex-wife Kathy was involved and she added that Kathy had been talking to the media. So she wanted her son to help her frame Kathy for Greg's murder, but she didn't frame it as framing because she believed that Kathy did it, but didn't have the evidence. So this is what she'd said. She asked her son to get some of his friends to help in the framing. She wanted them to go buy an extra large sweatshirt to wear the sweatshirt and then to go and shoot a gun, like at a gun range or whatever, so that there would be gunshot residue on said sweatshirt. She then wanted them to break into Kathy's car, but in like a non-obvious way so that it wouldn't look like it was broken into to stuff the sweater under the seat of her car and then to go and like use a payphone and call the police with an anonymous tip saying that the sweatshirt was there so that Kathy would get arrested. Now if that sounds fucked up because it's fucked up on a lot of levels. Like you're asking your son to do this. Don't worry. She did say she wanted to make sure it was one of his friends that did it and not him so that there'd be no chance that he could get in trouble. And he said when she asked all this, she was very calm and asked in a very matter of a fact way. But when Andrew hears this in his mind, he's like, yeah, no, I don't think I'm going to be doing that. That's quite the plan, but I don't think I'm going to be doing that. But outwardly, he just tells her like, okay, I'll take care of it. But as time goes on and he doesn't do it, finally, she gets kind of frustrated and is like, you know what? Fine. I'll take care of it myself. And then even told him that she had started making plans to take care of it herself. She said she had gone to Walmart and she had already bought two sweatshirts. She said she bought one in her size and bought the extra large one. And that she did this so that she could use the one in her size to like, transport the extra large one to make sure that she didn't leave her DNA on the extra large one. So she was really thinking this through. And overall, Andrew just said that she seemed off, just off in general. Her emotions were on a roller coaster. Some days she was crying, some days she was laughing, and she often changed like little details about the story. Like for example, she told the son that there was an intruder, but she also told the son that her and Greg had gotten into a fight that night and that he had thrown the wrench at her face and that's how she got the mark on her face. So Michelle goes on with her life and Greg has a funeral, a funeral that she did not help plan by the way, and didn't even go to dude, her own husband's funeral. I don't know if she was invited to be fair, but I guess Greg's family, his mother specifically was like waiting for her to call. I guess like Michelle never called his family, never called his mother, never even called his mom to tell her herself that Greg wasn't like with them anymore. So after several weeks of his family waiting around and Michelle not doing anything, not planning a funeral, not contacting them, nothing, they went about it themselves and planned the funeral and had the funeral, which again, Michelle didn't come. And again, I don't think she was invited because they felt really sketch about her right off the bat. But even though she didn't plan the funeral or go to the funeral, that did not stop her from having him cremated and immediately trying to benefit financially from his death. Obviously it did not take long for Michelle to try to cash in on Greg's life insurance policies. Now Greg had three different life insurance policies that totaled almost a million dollars. So this would have been a huge payout for her, but here was the problem. Greg's death was being ruled a suicide and these insurance policies, as many insurance policies do had a clause in it that was like, well, if you take your own life though, like your family's fucked, you don't get any money. So when she put in the application or whatever to get this money, she put, that he had died by murder, not by suicide, which was weird because on paper it was being listed as a suicide, at least now. 
But that would change soon. And I would say lucky for Michelle because like she does want his death ruled as a homicide. But since we're talking about her in the context today in this video, obviously it wasn't that lucky for her. But a month after Greg's murder, Greg's cause of death was ruled to be a homicide, not a suicide. Because after doing the autopsy and like doing, you know, tests as investigators do, they determined that he couldn't have killed himself because though he was shot in the temple with his own gun, the shot came from at least six inches away from his head. It would have been six to 24 inches away from his head. And in addition to that, he had this or this, I don't know which side I'm going to put it on, but this or this drug in his system, which is like a sedative commonly found in sleeping pills. I'm not even going to try to say it. You guys know that I can't say anything. So one of these was in his system and this would not have been the same thing as the Tylenol PM that she claimed he had taken. So with all of that considered, his cause of death was ruled a homicide. Manner of death. Cause of death. Manner of death. Manner of death was ruled a homicide. And speaking of the drugs, by the way, because something that's always like irritated me is that they never checked Michelle's daughter to see if she had drugs in her system, even though she had literally slept through the Slout TV, the gunshot, and police like traipsing through the house. She slept through all this, and I feel like they should have checked because I feel like I allegedly don't come for me as Stephanie Harlow says, I feel like perhaps this child might have been drugged and that's why she was able to sleep through all of this. But then again, I don't know how four year olds sleep. I only have a almost two year old. Don't even want to talk about it, but uh, I don't know. Can they sleep through all of that? If you have children that size slash age or have, let me know because I don't know. So with his death being ruled a homicide and the fact, I didn't mention this yet, that when Michelle was arrested, like when she was taken into custody initially, her clothes were taken and her clothes were tested for gunshot residue. And when they tested him, they found, which makes no sense to me because she was like so careful with the sweatshirt with her son, but whatever. They tested her clothes and they found that there was gunshot residue on the jacket that she was wearing, like on the sleeves of the jacket she was wearing that night, there was gunshot residue. And it was said to be a significant amount of gunshot residue. So in early January of 2012, while Michelle was walking into her gym, you know, just ready to get a pump on, she was arrested. And this time she was arrested for filing a false police report, tampering with evidence, and murder. She was originally held on a $520,000 bond, but it ended up being reduced to $82,000, which she has so many different bond things that go on. We're going to get into them. But with that, she was able to make bond, make bail, and get out. Once being bailed out of jail, Michelle moved in with her new boyfriend. You remember her son's friend, Jean? Yeah, she moved in with him. And it seemed pretty serious because they even opened a business together, a kettlebell gym called BHS Personal Training and Gym in nearby Bedford. She also changed her name likely to try to distance herself from the bad publicity associated with her name. So she started going by Shelly Williams and it was successful in distancing herself from the fact that she was awaiting trial for murdering her husband because during this time she worked effectively as a personal trainer at this gym. And she got to live that life for two years because the trial didn't begin until October of 2013. Well, the trial didn't actually begin. The trial was set to begin in October of 2013, but then Michelle ended up taking a plea deal. With this plea deal, she would serve anywhere between two and a half and 20 years with the prosecution recommending that she get 18 years. And this was going to be for deadly conduct, which is a third degree felony that is only a thing in some states and then also tampering with evidence. Now I was like, why the fuck could they give this bitch a plea deal? But it seemed that there were a couple of factors when it came to like evidence, the fact that, you know, she had wiped everything down. So there wasn't any physical proof she did it, but also there was a mistake on the police's part. Since Greg's death wasn't initially investigated as a murder, the scene wasn't handled and like processed with the same care that one would use if they were investigating a murder. So when Greg's body was transported from the house to like the hospital slash morgue, he was actually taken like wrapped up in his own bed sheet. And this is a bed sheet that could have contained evidence like, you know, gunpowder residue if he had like balanced the gun at a distance to kill himself in that way. Like they were trying, you know, like if he had taken his life, he would have had to have done. But that said, the sheet was compromised because it wasn't bagged and tagged and everything. So they were worried that if they had gone to trial on like first degree murder, that any competent defense attorney would have torn this apart, which yes, they probably would. So they offered her this plea deal so that they could get her in jail for something because they believed she was guilty. 
So she has a hearing set to find out how much time she's going to get and then to start serving that time. I believe she found out she was going to get 18 years, but she was going to have a hearing to begin like serving that time. But she ends up trying to get this delayed. She tells the judge that she is pregnant with twins. And apparently she comes with the receipts as the people say. And because of this, because she comes and she says that she is pregnant with twins, she ends up getting her sentence delayed. Like she was going to be able to finish her pregnancy and then have a couple of months with the small babies. <laughs> it's crazy. And then start serving her sentence. Apparently they did this. They agreed to this for a variety of reasons. First, it was like money was a big part of it because they didn't want the taxpayers to have to pay for like a high risk because she was older, um, pregnancy and like birth and then prenatal care after the fact. And they didn't want the babies to experience like stigma in their life from being born in jail, which I guess like kids are, kids are rude. If kids found out these kids are in like elementary school, they find out your mom gave birth to you in jail. Like kids are dicks. But I was just like, damn, this woman, she is thrifty. So the judge allows her to be on house arrest, right? She was going to be on house arrest wearing an ankle monitor until she gave birth and all that. And that was due to take place in April of 2014. But Shyamalan twist is she never ended up having these twins. Okay. She comes back for a hearing in January. And when she comes back, she's no longer pregnant. She's not pregnant at all. And she tells the court that she miscarried the twins at around eight months in that December which we'll talk a little bit later on whether or not that is true, if that actually happened. But with that information, she was rearrested and set to be sentenced. And Greg's family was so happy for her to finally be in jail. His ex-wife, Kathy, was stoked because she couldn't believe it had taken this long for her to be arrested in the first place. And she said of this quote, I think I might be able to sleep through the night tonight. Finally, something is on our side. So this time she was held on a $520,000 bond, but it actually ended up being raised this time instead of being reduced. And it was raised to $820,000. So almost a million dollars because they believe that this bitch might be a flight risk. And you know, what's wild about this is that a couple who had taken like training sessions at the gym that Michelle had bought with Jean, you remember this couple offered and wanted to post this woman's bail because they believed she was innocent though. I don't think that they ever did post her bail. But they were willing, they were willing to put $25,000 down for Michelle's bail because they said they could not believe, they could not see a world in which she did what they're saying that she did. And they wanted her to be treated how they believed she should be treated. Apparently this couple had come into some money when a father died and they wanted to put this money to good use. The husband of this couple, his name was Arthur. He said of this quote, we're not rich by any means but it's just enough to do what we think is right for a friend. I don't have that kind of money to lose or even to risk. But again, $25,000 wouldn't have been enough for the initial bail. It definitely wasn't enough once it was raised to like the over $800,000 bail. And then I believe her bail was just revoked altogether. So she wasn't getting out. So she is in jail awaiting sentencing so that she can start her full, you know, sentence. She's held in like a smaller jail, then she'll be sentenced. She'll go to a main jail. And while she is being held, waiting to be put into jail for, you know, the 18 years or whatever, she does two interviews. And in the first interview, she talks about how she's innocent, how she didn't do this, how Greg was killed in a home invasion and how she's scared. She's scared to go to jail. She's scared to be in a place with criminals because she herself is not a criminal. And she said it's hard for her to know that she chose this by taking the plea deal, but that she did it because she knew that it was a gamble to go to trial. And she was not willing to take that chance where she would be in jail for like 50 or a hundred years for something that she says she did not do. And she believed that she would get out at her first opportunity of parole. If she took this plea deal, when she, parole came up, she would get out at the first opportunity. And that was in just like three years. And in her second interview, which was an interview with 48 hours, which was one that she didn't believe was going to air until after she was sentenced, she again proclaimed her innocence. She said she was not guilty of any of the crimes that she had admitted to in her plea deal, which was a problem for her because since she did this interview before she was sentenced, how do I even word this properly? Because she did this interview before she was sentenced saying that the things that she admitted to that she was going to be sentenced for were not true. Her plea deal ended up getting revoked before she started serving those 18 years. And a lot of reports I read seemed to make it seem like 
it was just like immediately revoked. But what it turns out happened is that they had a hearing to discuss the facts that she had said this to try to see if they were going to revoke the plea deal, etc, etc. And during this hearing, when they start questioning her, she again starts proclaiming her innocence. She told the court, quote, I'm not guilty and I can't sit here and answer the questions the way you want me to. And the initial judge said, quote, Lady Justice may very well be blind, but she's neither deaf nor dumb. And with that, her plea was changed to not guilty and she was going to have to go to trial. She was going to have to go and see what a jury thought about all this. And apparently her sister said that she thinks that this is what Michelle really wanted in the first place because she believes that Michelle was the type of person who thought she could just charm the pants off that jury because she was used to getting whatever she wanted with her charm. And then, dude, this woman is so wild. There's just so much to this case. They found out that during the time that she had been out on house arrest, Michelle had been able to get out of her GPS monitor, like the little bracelet, the little anklet. She was able to get it off. So here's what happened. When they were putting it on, she asked the court if they could put it on a little loose because she was pregnant with twins. And when you're pregnant, if you do not know, you can swell like a motherfucker. Like when I tell you that in my third trimester of my pregnancy, I got lucky. It didn't happen until the third. But when it happened, it was on another level. I could not believe it. Like when I gave birth, one of the things I was most excited for is my legs and ankles not being sausages and not swelling to the point that it hurts because it can hurt swelling. It's crazy. So she asked them to put it a little loose. So they found this out because they look at her GPS records and they realized that most of the days she was wearing it, there was zero movement, which is basically impossible. They said that even if a person was wearing it and had like rolled over in bed, like if they were on bed rest, rolled over in bed, it would register a movement, but there was zero movement, which meant she wasn't wearing it. And when they looked into it, they found that yes, that was true. She wasn't wearing it. She had been able to wiggle out and she was going by fake names. She was going to work at a strip club. She went to a, a beach vacation with her boyfriend. She taught kettlebell classes, all of it. But one thing that she didn't do, a very big thing that she never did, she never went to a doctor's appointment, not a single doctor's appointment. Even after miscarrying eight month old twins, no doctor's appointment. And this is how they were able to determine that she had never been pregnant. She couldn't even give them the name of a doctor. Like this woman, man, she is nothing but ideas. <laughs> it's a rude timer. And you know, what's wild about this is it seems like such an outrageous thing to do, but Michelle's sister said that she wasn't surprised to hear this at all. Michelle was the type of person who would lie about being pregnant throughout her life to try to like get what she wanted or get attention, which is just like, that's a terrible thing to do. And you are a terrible person, which I think we've already established that she's a terrible person. Um, oh, and there's more in addition to all the things that she did, you know, the kettlebell classes, the beach, all that. Well, she was out. She was also looking up how to like on the internet, how to get a fake birth certificate, how to get fake social security cards and how to like live life as a fugitive. So I bet that that's part of the reason that they didn't give her bail because they thought that that bitch was going to skip town. So now that she's going to have an actual trial, the judge has to determine if she's going to get bail, which is what I was just talking about. And uh, he said, no, he determined that like, no, I don't think we're going to let her out on bail this time because of all the reasons that I just said. Now the trial. So Michelle's defense at trial was that she had not killed Greg, that he had killed himself. So they switched back to that story now. And in addition to saying that he killed himself, they also tried to kill his memory a little bit, not a little bit, a lot of it. They talked about his steroid use. They talked about the fact that he had been abusive to his ex-wife, Kathy. And she even testified and said that that was true, that when he would get mad, he would punch her in the arm sometimes, which is not good. And she confirmed that Greg had been using steroids and that she said though, that she knew he had used them, but that he had successfully weaned himself off. But the defense pointed out that he had not, that when he was with Michelle, he was still using steroids and that in their home, they found three different types of steroids during the, you know, police investigation. Basically, they were just trying to paint the picture of an angry and depressed man hopped up on steroids who couldn't handle the fact that his brother-in-law had died. And I guess his grandmother had also died recently. So this is what they were trying to use to show that he took his own life. But you know, the prosecution had plenty. One of the first things that they had, or one of the things that they had that was most helpful was her interrogation footage from right after Greg was killed. She, her attorney, by the way, did try to get this thrown out saying that her Miranda rights weren't read, ETC, ETC, but she had expressed eagerness to talk to police. And at the time she wasn't being arrested. 
uh, she was being treated as a witness, a victim. So they show this tape and it's very helpful because you can see firsthand her, how she is right after he died, her body language, the way that she spoke. You could hear her voice and you could see that she just lied like a rug, bro. She changed her story over and over. And now it wasn't just the prosecution saying she was a liar. They could see it firsthand. They could watch it. And on top of that, they got to see in this video that several times during this investigation, not investigation, interrogation, questioning, because it was so questioning, um, she said over and over, Greg did not kill himself. She said herself during this video, like during this interrogation, that he did not hurt himself. He had no reason to hurt himself. He was a happy and cheerful guy. And during this time, she was trying to push the narrative that somebody had murdered him. And she said that Greg had like a lot of unsavory friends and that sometimes he felt like he needed to sleep with one eye open. It took hours of the police saying he either took his own life or you took his life and her denying it before she finally said that he did it. And the jury is in the courtroom watching this and it, her you know, defense of him taking his own life isn't super convincing now after they've watched her for hours say that that's not what happened. They also played six clips from that 48 hours interview that Michelle did while she was in prison. And during this interview, she said that Greg was killed, that she had a pretty good idea who did it, and that the person who did it was letting her sit in jail taking the blame. So again, she's not saying that he killed himself. And the prosecutor said it best when they said of Greg's murderer, quote, she sees the killer of her husband every single day that she gets up and looks in the mirror every single day. So you bet your bottom dollar that she knows who killed her husband because it's her. After playing the, the clips from the 48 hours interview for the jury, the prosecutor then kind of attacked Michelle's character a little bit saying, quote, she is so arrogant. She is so convinced of her powers to manipulate and to glibly say and have people believe whatever she wants them to. It's a fantasy world that she lives in, where right is left and up is down and yes is no and wrong is right. She wants to draw you in that fantasy world with this claim of suicide. And if all of that wasn't bad enough, one of the strongest, I think, one of the strongest witnesses that they had for the prosecution was Michelle's own son, Andrew, the one that she had tried to convince to frame Kathy for Greg's murder. He went on the stand and he told them all about that. He also told the court that he believed his mother was trying to frame his brother, Lee, Michelle's own son for the murder as well, which is so crazy. He said that one day his mother called him and told him that she believed that Lee may have been responsible for killing Greg. And he's like, man, what the fuck? Cause like, it was no secret that neither of her adult sons liked Greg, but to kill him, to murder him, or even to suggest it like, absolutely not. It was manipulative and it was evil. And the prosecutor said of this quote, who does this? Someone who's guilty, someone who's trying to get away with murder. That's who does this. Andrew said it was at this point that he cut off communication with his mom because he couldn't believe what she was implying. Like he knew that Lee and his mom had had a recent fight, but to imply that he could have been responsible for, for the murder of her husband, like ma'am, like mom. Oh, also speaking of Lee, he was able to testify. This is just like a little thing, but it's something I'm going to tell you about it. Lee testified that he knew that his mom was able to get out of the, uh, the ankle monitor. Cause you remember that they believed that she was able to, he confirmed it. He said that they had been like hanging out, maybe at a barbecue. It doesn't matter. And that she had like opened her purse and been like, look, and her like ankle monitor was in there. And she like bragged about being able to take it off. She said she was in the shower one day when she realized she could do it. So she would just throw it in her purse and carry it around with her sometimes when she left. Now, why? Why would Michelle kill Greg? It seems like it was all for money. 100% for money, tale as old as time. This woman had literally pulled out $100,000 in cash, had charged $70,000 to their cards. And it's not like she was bringing any money in because she was using the yogurt shop as like her ATM. She would just go in there during the day, not really working there and just pull the money out of the cash register. So she wasn't bringing money in. So the two were about to buy their dream house. And Greg was under the assumption that they had the money to do this. But in actuality, they didn't even have enough to put down for the mortgage of this home. And Greg was about to find that out. The couple needed $100,000, about $100,000 to put down to close on this house, which was going to be like the day after Greg was killed. And it turns out in their checking accounts, they only had like $30,000. And Michelle had used a fraudulent account to like secure a loan to even get this far in the first place. It's even believed that it's possible 
that Greg had found out that they had had this discussion, that Greg had gotten pissed that that night they had gotten into a fight and that he actually had hit her in the face. And that's how she got that bruise on her face. And then she killed him. So the prosecution said of the reason for killing Greg, and I quote, the motive was money, tried and true, age old, money, greed. Now her attorney tried to say that Greg was Michelle's golden goose and that he was worth way more to her alive than dead. And then pointed out that in the weeks after Greg was killed, Michelle was overdrafting and pulling out money like crazy. And her attorney said of this quote, does this look like someone who planned to kill their husband for money? Within a week, she's out of money. They added that their client wasn't perfect, but this wasn't a trial to find out if she had, you know, good character and that the jury needed to put out all negative feelings about Michelle, like out of their mind when making their decision. The prosecution closed their, you know, arguments with saying that Michelle was a cold blooded killer. They said that she was calculated and that she had carefully tried to cover up what she did. They said that she had pull tried at least to pull the wool over everyone's eyes and added quote, don't let her get away with it. And the defense ended by saying, quote, the worst thing our system can do is convict an innocent person. That's a decision you'll have to live with for the rest of your lives. After a six day trial where Michelle never took the stand, by the way, and seven hours of deliberation that were broken over a two day period, the jury came back with their verdict. On the prosecution side sat Greg's family, along with some members of Michelle's family to sit and listen to the verdict be read. 45 year old Michelle was found guilty of tampering with evidence and the murder of her husband. She was then given 60 years for the murder and 10 years for the tampering with evidence to run concurrently. So she will be scheduled or like up for parole in 30 years when she is 75 years old. Greg's mother gave a victim impact statement where she spoke directly to Michelle saying, quote, Greg loved and trusted you with his business and his life. Now Greg is gone and he'll never see his daughters grow up. She added that Michelle ruined her family and Greg's family. And that's true because she left her daughter, Michaela with no parents. I guess she's living with like family friends and she does still see her mother, at least as of the last reporting, she saw her mother. They would drive her up from time to time to visit. And they said that they would do this as long as she wanted to. But just imagine being in that position from four years old. And Michelle, this woman had no emotional reaction. She didn't show any sign of emotion until she was handcuffed and led away to start serving her sentence. And that when something was happening to her finally is when she cried. Now, Michelle's attorneys immediately said that they would appeal and, and they did. Michelle did appeal. Basically her reasons for appealing were that her written and spoken statements should not have been admitted into evidence that the medical examiner who uh, testified at trial was not the one who actually performed the autopsy and basically said that the evidence shown did not prove that she had committed a murder, but ultimately the appeals court disagreed and they stuck with like the trial court's decision. So she's still in jail. This is just such a complicated case, dude. There are so many things to this case that I, that I didn't even mention because we would literally, not literally figuratively be here all day. If there is not a podcast dedicated specifically to this case, there should be, because there's just so much like, okay, for example, one of the judges, like you may remember earlier in the case, I mentioned that the judge who said that lady justice was blind, but she wasn't deaf or dumb, that this was the initial judge. And that's because this judge ended up recusing himself from the case. One of the groups of Michelle's attorneys actually asked to be like, released from her employee during the case. And Greg's family thinks it's possible that Gr that Michelle not only got away with killing Greg, well, not got away because she got caught, but not only killed Greg, but got away with another murder in their family because they believe that she may be responsible for the death of Greg's best friend slash brother-in-law, Bryn Fletcher, because apparently Bryn's cause of death was ruled as being a suicide. But this was after Michelle steered the investigators in that direction by telling them that Bryn had previously tried to take his own life by ingesting a bunch of pills. And this is something that his wife denies even happened. And what's weird about this, I said I wasn't going to get into it, but here I am getting into it, is that, okay, so Bryn's wife, her name is Michelle also. So Bryn's wife, Michelle, was devastated after this and in just like the worst possible state. And Michelle, Greg's killer, was helping her. So she was helping take care of things and ended up bringing like different papers for Michelle Bryn's wife to sign. 
right? And apparently one of these papers that she brought for her to sign, because she's like out of her mind in grief and she's just signing things because she trusts this woman. This is like her sister-in-law. One of these papers was like authorization for Bryn to get cremated like the next day. And on top of that, like with Greg, nobody saw Bryn as being in a mental state to do this. He seemed happy. He seemed hopeful. Apparently he was like super stoked because Christmas was right around the corner and he got all these like really sweet gifts for his kids for Christmas and was like bragging to his coworkers that he was so excited to see them open them and experience that. But then he was said to have taken his life just days before Christmas. Now, as far as the theory and the why, Greg's family believes, Bryn's family believes that the reason that Michelle may have done this is that based on the timing of when this happened, that Bryn may have seen something in relation to Michelle and the poisoning at the hands of Greg's 12 year old daughter. Apparently Bryn was super close with Greg. They were like business partners and friends and he was always in the house. So there's a good chance that he could have seen something. This is what they say. They think that it's possible that he saw something because they also found that in his phone, there were some photos of Michelle that looked like they were taken without her knowing, which was weird because he didn't really take photos in his phone. And Bryn's family just wants police to look into it because they've always felt weird about it. And now that they know what Michelle's capable of, they wouldn't put her, wouldn't put it past her to have done something to Bryn. Bryn's wife said that she has always known that there was something not quite right about Michelle Williams. And then she said of her quote, the first time I met Michelle Williams, I felt the presence of evil. And with that, that my friends is the story of the complicated murder of Greg Williams. I hope that you found my telling of this to be informative and it made sense. And of course, I just want to thank you for remembering Greg with me today. Now, considering everything I told you throughout this video, I now want to revisit the question of the day, the questions I have several, and these are them. What do you think happened to Greg that day? Do you think that Michelle killed him? Do you think it's possible that he took his own life? Do you think it's possible that she's responsible for the death of his brother-in-law, Bryn? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below, because this one is so complicated. I feel like there's going to be a lot of opinions here. Anyways, guys, before you leave, please don't forget to leave me a comment down below with what case you'd like to see me cover in the future. As you know, or you may not know, I have a long list of cases. And whenever you leave me a case suggestion, I put it on the list with your name next to it. So I can give you a shout out if I cover it. I love looking into the cases that you guys suggest because they're often cases I haven't heard of or cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with great ideas and great taste. Otherwise you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two weeks, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below for your convenience, along with a link to my membership and a link to my merch store. And now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.